the 380 ACP versus the 9mm. Now is 380 enough for self-defense? Dave and I are going to talk about it right now. Hello, friends and lovers. This is Dave Trillo, and you're listening to the Ammunition Guide podcast brought to you by none other than Ammo.com. Chris, we're venturing away from our usual compare something to the 308 motif, <laughs> and we're comparing something that isn't the 308 to the 9mm. Uh, I understand you've got kind of a negative experience with the 380 auto, though. Well, it's actually not the 380 that I have uh, the negative experience with. It was actually a 9mm. And trust me, if you've listened to our other handgun podcast, you'll know that I am a huge 9mm fan. And uh, when you're talking about 380 and 9mm, I think the biggest thing that uh, you got to consider is recoil. And if you like to go shooting and you like your recoil or don't like it, make sure you get all of your ammo here at ammo.com. Click on that link down in the description and uh, get yourself a $20 off coupon. Uh, but yeah, Dave and I were talking about this before we started recording. And he's like, dude, we got to get that in the podcast. So I want to tell you guys an experience I had with uh, one of the first handguns I ever purchased, which was a, uh, well, you know, let's not name names. All right, uh, you know we don't need to to badmouth anybody, but let's just say it was a subcompact True. single stack nine millimeter, and this thing was light, right? And I had been watching all the different YouTube channels talking about concealed carry and things like that, and everybody the the single stack nine millimeter was all the rage, uh, you know, back then, back in the early two thousands, that was the go to thing. Uh, you know, you had all these new lightweight guns going out, so I decided to go ahead and pick myself up one. It wasn't terribly expensive, but I have to tell you, this was the most uncomfortable gun to shoot. And a lot of it was due because of the lightweight of the handgun and the recoil of the 9mm. Now, you may be saying to yourself, Chris, 9mm doesn't have that much recoil. What are you talking about? And this is something that I always talk to everybody who's going to purchase a handgun in the future is if you can go shoot that handgun before you plunk your money down to buy it because just because i'm sitting here telling you or dave's here telling you like hey nine millimeters got low recoil a lot of it depends on the weight of the firearm yeah well the weight of the firearm is one of the four things that determines recoil energy the others being bullet weight muzzle velocity and powder weight which mm -hmm. i don't I don't know how much powder weight really changes recoil, but uh, yeah, it is something to be said for a heftier chunk of steel, especially when you're trying to direct ac rapid, accurate fire during the heat of a moment. Definitely. And, you know, the one thing I had always considered after I eventually, of course, sold this handgun because it was the most picky thing I had ever purchased. It was picky on ammo. Uh, and, of course, it was really picky on my hand to the point where it was uncomfortable to shoot. The one question I had always thought was like, would this have been better if it was a 380? Now, a lot of people bash on the 380, and they say that it's not powerful enough. It's an anemic round. It's not good enough for concealed carry. But uh, there are a lot of uh, you know people pushing up daisies who might suggest otherwise that the 380 is not enough. And the one thing that the 380 has going for it is lower recoil than the 9mm to the tune of about 50%, which isn't insignificant. That's fair. And to be sure, you want a round to deal at least 220 pounds, foot-pounds of energy to its target. And very few 380 rounds can actually do that, like a plus P naturally. But usually even its muzzle energy just stops shy of 220. So there is something to the 380 detractor's argument. That's very fair, uh, and you know I would definitely give you that that it is a little bit on the light side uh, compared to a nine millimeter. But uh, I think yes, the foot pounds of energy is important, but also that shot placement is important. And I think that is the one thing where the 380 really shines is it's incredibly comfortable to shoot, so that you don't develop a recoil flinch, which is really bad uh, obviously for throwing your shots off target and not something you want to do and I, yeah i'm looking here at the uh the 380 ballistics table that we have on the article that we wrote about this and you're absolutely right dave most of them don't even come close to 220 uh but yeah. if, if you can but put that's, those that's shots pure muzzle energy oh yeah you're going to assume the bullet's going to cover a little ground 
Although you're probably not firing at a target farther than five yards if you're pulling out your 380 for self-defense. Yeah, absolutely. I think most of those engagements will be pretty close to point blank. I mean, I'm not planning on taking a 50-yard shot with a 380. I don't know about you. But, uh, yeah, those plus P rounds will definitely do it. And the other thing that a lot of people, uh, you know, I know the old adage was that if you are going to carry a 380, you need to carry FMJ because of the lack of penetration going hand in hand with that muzzle energy uh it early versions of hollow point ammo for 380 wouldn't penetrate deep enough I, the fbi tests say you want 12 inches uh or t between 12 and 18 is the fbi protocol and 380 stopped right around nine inches mm -hmm. yeah and uh i think they've improved hollow point they over have signs a lot so even even a relatively anemic round like the 380 you're gonna get deep enough penetration accompanied by some expansion although even still some of the the cheaper jhps on the market like ones you might find on cellular rebellion and pretty mm -hmm. partisan mm -hmm. did i say cellular rebellion correctly i never knew that's a good question i've never really looked up the pronunciation on that either right. people can we'll call it correct us feel we free to correct budget. us down in the comments guys budget-friendly 380 jhps generally don't exhibit any terminal expansion even in optimal conditions so keep that in mind too that you're well like you said shot placement matters mm -hmm. and it especially matters if your jhp is going to exhibit the same terminal ballistics as an fmj absolutely make sure you're getting that quality hollow point ammunition and if you're shooting 380 in my opinion you're going to need a plus p now that will affect recoil a little bit but i'm pretty sure if memory serves it's not even going to get you close to nine millimeter levels of recoil yeah, yeah, you'd said that it was like 50% of the mm -hmm. recoil of a 9mm. Yeah. If it's plus P, I think you're looking closer to 60% realistically. I think that's a pretty fair assessment, and I don't yeah. don't think that that total should be... Total guess. Yeah, a it's total a, guess. usually plus P ammo is about a 10% powder charge higher uh, than your normal, uh, you know, standard loading. But that won't, uh, you know, equate to a huge jump in recoil. It'll be some. You'll be able to tell between your cheap practice FMJ ammo and your, you know, your plus P uh, jacketed hollow point self-defense rounds. But uh, it, it's one of those things where you have to practice uh, your shot placement, and that's the most important thing. And with this handgun that I had purchased, it was offensive, honestly, to practice, and I hated it. And I didn't want to go to the range with the thing. And that's the worst situation you can be in because you need to practice with your carry gun as much as possible so that when that moment comes, you know that you're going to know what to do. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to point out, and I believe John Browning developed the 380 specifically with the commercial market in mind. He did. That said, several countries did adopt it as their standard... Uh, pistol cartridges at least before world war ii now i know czechoslovakia and hungary and italy hardly lead the way in terms of military technology but Fair. the fact that they used it at all and you got to assume some guys use it successfully it does kind of speak in favor of its utility as a self-defense cartridge oh absolutely no you're you're 100 percent correct that they did i also believe the uh the netherlands picked it up prior to World War II as well. Uh, but then afterwards, they magically all switched to the 9mm. Uh, so, you know, it definitely, the 380 will do the job if you need it to, but the 9mm simply just kind of does it better, uh, to be honest with you. You've got more powder charge, you've got more uh, muzzle velocity, muzzle energy, uh, you're going to have better penetration, more expansion on your hollow points, and it just makes a bigger hole. True. And we got to point out that the gap between the 380 and the 9 millimeter has only grown wider oh, yeah. since the uh, mid 40s. Because, man, have they ever researched the heck out of the 9 millimeter? They've pretty much done as much as they can with that route. I don't know if the 380's got nearly as much R and D behind it, but the 9 mil is just fit as much performance as it can into that little package no you're absolutely right i think kind of the 380 went by the wayside if you ask me for the most part because it didn't have that widespread adoption by law enforcement and military you are completely correct as far as hollow points for nine millimeter probably the most researched uh you know most r and uh hollow point on the market if you ask me and it will do the job that's for sure as long as your shot placement is on point yeah, and uh, 
Well, we got to talk a little bit more about the importance of recoil because naturally, you know, people are okay experiencing discomfort if they're going to be defending themselves. Of course. But I touched on this. You you want to fire more than one shot in self-defense. You're not Definitely. you're not James Bond. So maybe we should talk a little bit to how low recoil really facilitates rapid accurate fire, which would be a, a huge point in the 380's favor. Definitely. And, you know, if you've been watching Bond lately, he's been firing more than one bullet. So, you know, even Bond needs to shoot more than once. Uh, And this is kind of something that, you know, may have been, you know, perpetuated by Hollywood or things like that, making this this one shot self-defense situation. And though it can happen, most of the time it doesn't. Most of the time you're going to be firing multiple rounds. And when that happens, you know, when you pull the trigger, you get that recoil impulse and your muzzle goes up. We call it muzzle flip. And the lower the muzzle flip, the faster you're going to be able to get off subsequent, uh, you know, follow-up shots. Now, there's a lot that you can do with training as far as grip, stance, uh, you know, things along those lines to really help mm-hmm. mitigate that muzzle flip. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've seen Jerry Michalak unload a forty four mag in half a sec. The dude's crazy. Uh, I, I mean, but yeah. the thing is, most of us are not going to attain that level. Uh, of... No, I'd say I'm roughly as good as Jerry Michalak, but the average Joe, no way. Oh, fair enough. Yeah, I mean, I, you sure. know, I've hang, hung out on the range. I can say that Dave undoubtedly is, is pretty close to Jerry's Pro- levels. Probably the second greatest living shooter. Oh, without a doubt. Just not, Thank you know, you. Thank you. no one knows about you. That's all there. We, we try and keep it under wraps here that uh, you know, <laughs> we have such a professional shooter in our midst. Yeah, yeah, they don't even want to put me on camera, folks. They're it's... trying to really closely guard its secret here. Oh, absolutely. But, yeah, I mean, the, the, you look at somebody like that who has literally su- probably sent millions of rounds downrange, uh, and the average shooter is not going to have the, you know, the unlimited budget uh, to do that sort of thing. Uh, but always, if you can, make sure you're training with your carry gun as much as possible so that you're used to that recoil, you understand how much uh, that muzzle is going to rise and what you need to do to get it back down on target in an appropriate amount of time. And for a lot of shooters, they find that it's easier to shoot a 380. Uh, and a, a lot of it comes to that recoil impulse. And, uh, you know, when you don't have to worry about that recoil impulse, you can really focus on those fundamentals of mark, marksmanship, primarily your trigger squeeze, and it really helps with accuracy. Yeah, and to be sure, some folks are always going to do better with lighter recoil. Yeah. Um, and I think this brings us to the 380's other huge advantage over the 9 mil. So we've got these rounds, the 22 LR, the 25 ACP, the 32 ACP, the 380 Auto. And uh, I kind of grouped them together as as purse guns. Fair enough. Which is to suggest, you know, ladies, many of them have much lighter frames. Mm -hmm. And they find the uh, lower recoil a lot easier to to fire. Fellas, don't let that dissuade you from from trying out one of these rounds. Oh, yeah. But um, a purse gun has to be small. Mm-hmm. And I think the 380 uh, ACP pistol's superior concealability means a lot, especially in an era when you may not want every Tom, Dick, and Harry to know you're packing. Oh, definitely. And if there's one, uh, you know, firearm that is, you know, about as light as you can get that I would feel comfortable carrying, it would be a 380. I mean, you can get some really tiny 380s like. Uh, the Ruger LCP uh, in 380 is ridiculously small. Uh, the Keltec P3AT, ridiculously thin and light and small. And these things you can carry deep. I mean, like deep cover. No one's going to have any idea that you're packing this. And there's something to be said for that, especially along comfort lines. One of the things that I, I think a lot of people you know, don't talk about is comfort when you're carrying a firearm. Mm-hmm. You know, if you've got something really bulky and heavy on your hip, it's not as comfortable to carry, to sit down with, to drive, you know, whatever it is that you might be doing. And that's going to wear on you after a while. And you're going to be like, oh, I don't really need to take the pistol out today. Do I really need to strap up that, you know, that full size yes. Glock 17? Uh, no, I, I think we'll be okay. Nothing's going to happen. Uh, whereas, you're going to be more inclined to carry something lighter. And these 380 firearms, they have really trimmed the weight down on them. Yeah, that's the peril of carrying inside the waistband, is you're going mm-hmm. to be having a barrel digging into your groin sometimes if 
if you're keeping it in the front. Oh yeah. And uh, to that end, the 380, if you want a, a backup gun in your ankle holster, mm-hmm. you know, I know a lot of people aren't going to want to bother with ankle holsters. It's usually not recommended for your primary carry because it's just awkward to get at your ankle during that split second of opportunity. Oh yeah. But that P3AT you mentioned mm-hmm. wears great around an ankle, great backup weapon. And I think a lot of law enforcement officers would agree, even if they prefer a Glock 42 over Keltex only 380, it's uh, it's just a lot more feasible to keep a smaller handgun like this. Definitely somewhere back up. Yeah, I mean, like if you want to talk about an ankle gun, you really have to go light. Uh, that's the thing; those ankle holsters don't necessarily have the support like you would carrying inside the waistband or even outside the waistband, uh, and. Yeah, you need something light for one of those ankle holsters. And, and like you said, they're, they're really not that fast on the draw, so it's not going to be my primary choice as a, uh, you know, a carry option, but you know, it's better to have it than not, uh, than not in case you need that backup gun. It's always good to have that. And it's honestly a very economic option as well. These 380 firearms are not terribly expensive. Yeah. Yeah, that's always nice. So they mm-hmm. probably shouldn't, you know, if you can spend more on your... On your... Oh, yeah carry weapon do but uh i'll just leave it at that you know something interesting about the 380 if you want to talk about how much smaller the 380 handgun is i know when they were first doing uh when they were first filming the matrix Mm -hmm. chris and the matrix chris for those who don't know at home is a movie I know. And, uh, it's one of my so favorites. They're filming the Matrix, and they got the, the guns all figured out for the characters. And they realized that Carrie Ann Moss, a small lady, looks preposterous holding full size 9mm handguns. So, what do they do? They give her 380s, they give her Beretta Cheetahs. Now, that and, is something uh, I didn't know. Now they're much more proportionate to her body. She doesn't look like Yosemite Sam anymore. <laughs> so. <clears throat> You're not picking a handgun for stylistic choices, but I think that that does kind of summarize the difference is that the 380 just looks appropriate in the hands of uh, a lady or will include smaller shooters in that category. And, you know, I think that's one thing that's very important, especially when you're training a new shooter or somebody who's a little bit smaller frame who doesn't have a lot of experience with firearms to start off really light. And if you want to start off with a center fire handgun, then absolutely 380 is definitely the choice to start off with. Of course, I'm always going to default to the 22 LR as being the perfect training round. But mm-hmm. if you want to start them off with some power, then 380 is definitely the way to go. Yeah, actually, we should probably discuss, I know this is 9mm versus 380, but um, a lot of people consider the 22 LR for self-defense just because it's so tiny, mm-hmm. so re- low recoil. Now that you're talking about a really weak cartridge yes. and you got to keep in mind that reported muzzle energies were recorded using rifle length test barrels yep so your handgun is going to be even weaker if it's firing 22 lr but chris i think the biggest black eye against the 22 lr is something just fundamental to its design and that's the inherent lower reliability of the rimfire primer compared to the center fire Absolutely, uh, Dave, and I personally would never recommend carrying 22 LR as a self-defense round. Now, I know that the, the, the comment sections are going to go off right now, but I'm going to take a stance on it. I'm going to say no to rimfire uh, as, as a self-defense cartridge. I get it. Lots of people uh, you know, are killed every year by 22 LR in accidents uh, and even in self-defense. It doesn't yeah. mean it's the best choice. Yeah, you always got to acknowledge that any round of ammunition can kill somebody. Oh, absolutely. But I, that kind of almost goes without saying, because most of them were designed for that specific purpose. 22 LR was not designed for self-defense. Yeah. But um, Rimfire fire primer, just by virtue of its design, cannot be as reliable as a center fire. Definitely. And that's uh, that's something people who, who like pointing out that the 22 LR is more powerful than the 25 ACP. True. Yeah. But I'd way rather count than a 25 ACP with its little boxer primer. I can't count how many times I've been out on the range with my Walther P22 and I pull the trigger and it just goes click. Uh, the simple truth is those rimfire primers are not as reliable. They're not as stable. And a lot of it comes down to how well the primer is spread around that rim in the manufacturing mm-hmm. process. And are you willing to bet your life that 
your 22 LR has been perfectly spread out, will fire every time, no matter what. I will say there are some, not all 22 LR is created equal. Uh, you know, True. I think that's fair. There's, there's some that's going to be better. CCI and there's mm-hmm. the other guys. Exactly. I agree with you on that one, Dave. But, I mean, for me personally, I've had way too many clicks uh, and not enough bangs uh, to be able to say that, yeah, that's going to be reliable enough for concealed carry uh, or, you know, self-defense in general. Can you do it? Yes, you can. The Joker and Batman showed us that you can be killed with a pencil. So did John Wick. Does that mean I'm carrying around pencils for my CCW? No, it's not. Uh, you know, so just because it can be used for self-defense doesn't mean that it should. And I would totally prefer a 380 over a 22 LR any day. I just realized the mechanical pencil is like the semi-automatic of writing utensils. It is, now that you think about which, that. Which brings me to one more thing I want to add to the 22 for self-defense discussion. Mm-hmm. If you can't be dissuaded from carrying a 22 LR for self-defense, at least go with a revolver. Because then That's fair. failure to fire just means you got to pull the trigger again instead of dealing with uh, with a jammed round. That's a very good point, and that's uh, definitely one of the advantages of a revolver. If you do have a failure to fire, you just pull that trigger again. You just keep pulling until she goes. Uh, mm-hmm. You know that's definitely a plus. Whereas opposed, to you got to do a tap rack bang drill or something like that. Yeah, no, I think uh, I think that that's the revolver's greatest greatest advantage for self defense. Definitely. Got a got a chamber ain't working. Just here's a new chamber. Exactly. Go. So getting back to it, we got 380 ACP. It's two key advantages: lower recoil, more concealable and comfortable to carry firearm. But the nine mil just offers that peace of mind. I mean, if you go with a plus P, I think you can realistically expect double the energy on impact from the 380 and. Uh, just commanding i know we hate the phrase stopping power oh yeah might might be the most appealing uh feature you could ask for from your self-defense round definitely and i mean this is it's a big point of controversy you know in the shooting community i can't tell you how many threads i've read on gun boards and you know self-defense boards for concealed carry about 380 versus nine millimeter and honestly in my opinion it comes down to what you shoot the best now, you may be asking me, like, Chris, are you carrying 380 now because of that nine, bad experience you had with the 9mm? No, that was because it was the type of firearm that I was firing. I'm still carrying 9mm. I'm not carrying a super slim subcompact that I don't like to shoot right now. Uh, I'll tell you that. But uh, for me, I'm still going to stick with the 9mm, even though I had that issue when I started shooting. I've, you know, come to understand how uh, to handle, you know, a handgun better. Uh, how the grip, how important that is, and you know, just ammunition selection, selecting the right ammo for the job. But I will caveat: don't feel that you are undergunned with the 380. Uh, it will definitely save your life. It does it for scores of people every year, and uh, you should never feel like you don't have enough power. Just make sure that you're training with that higher quality plus P jacketed hollow point ammunition, and you should be just fine. Yeah. Well, I kind of like it at that. I, I, I did kind of want to ask you, though, okay. if you have any experience hand-loading the 380 ACP. I have. Um, 380 ACP is probably the bane of my existence, to be honest with you. Uh, uh, because they look so similar to 9mm rounds, I have to be incredibly careful when I'm sorting my brass to make sure that my 380 is uh, you know, segregated away from my 9mm. I don't currently reload for 380 but i can tell you that i have resized and accidentally primed 380 brass more than i like to admit uh in my progressive reloader and every time i do it i know that there's something wrong uh so i would say as far as a reloader is concerned if you're picking up range brass or things like that or even if you've purchased brass like once fired it's real easy for this stuff to get stuck in your nine millimeters so keep an eye out for that and just uh, segregate it away save it resell it or throw it in the trash, whichever you prefer, uh, you know, but uh, for me, as far as reloading is concerned, you shouldn't have too much problem sourcing materials if you can find primers these days, uh, but, uh, you know, as far as bullets or powder is concerned, you're going to be able to reload a lot of 380 uh, for not a whole lot of uh, powder because that powder charge is pretty tiny. Yeah, that, that's funny that the 380's greatest impact on your hobby is, is annoying you with its yes. brass you collect. 
Well, the thing is, it's only two millimeters shorter than nine millimeter, right? So if you just quickly mm -hmm. glance at it, you're not going to be able to see a huge difference in once fired brass. The one thing that I have to do when I'm reloading is I'll typically I'll set up all my brass and I'll check to make sure that it's all the same height. Uh, and every once in a while, I have one of those 380 sneak in on me. Well, that raises an interesting question. They're identical diameters, mm -hmm. very close in length. What if I accidentally loaded 380 in a nine mil? And vice versa. I, okay, so if you put a 380 in a 9 mil, it will fire, but you are risking case head separation at that point because you're not going to be head spacing appropriately. Because typically with rimless rounds, the firearm will uh, head space on the mouth of the cartridge. So it'll fire. I've seen people do it. I would not recommend it. Uh, you're, you're just asking for trouble at that point. Uh, and of course you're going to mess up your brass and you could get to the point where you have a failure to extract because now that brass has been blown out because it's not being supported by the chamber as well as it should be and you could cause a jam in your firearm. Other way around, 9mm will not fit into a 380 chamber, it's too long. So you don't even have to worry about that. Exactly, it'll just jam right away. But honestly you probably won't be able to even fit it in your magazine. Yeah, good point, good point. Just trying to slip it directly into your chamber so not not horrible head it wouldn't be as disastrous as say firing 300 blackout in a 5.56 ar yeah you shouldn't have anything like that level of you know destruction occur occur should something like that happen but uh you know because the bullet diameters are technically the same uh you won't have you know a a potential you know gun ending uh issue or uh you know event but it's not good for your firearm and you really should avoid doing it uh whenever possible right so i think we've summarized fairly well the uh relative pros and cons of these rounds it's it's, it's a lot easier than than comparing rifle cartridges because we can kind of take the long distance shooting discussion off the table exactly um, we got to take our, our sniper skills we don't have to discuss those yeah yeah, like maybe if you're taking a carbine out coyote hunting, you're a little more interested in the 50 plus yard performance. But oh, yeah. uh, we're just going to assume you're you're standing your ground against a rapidly advancing immediate threat to your personal safety for the purposes of the discussion we just had. Definitely. And, you know, honestly, I think you'll be fine with either. My preference is still going to be the 9mm like we talked about earlier. I want that extra mm -hmm. penetration, that extra power, and that extra expansion we get from all these modern 9mm hollow points. But... If you are more comfortable shooting a 380, if you shoot it better and you are very accurate with that handgun, then you shouldn't feel undergunned because it will do the job. And I think that's the final uh, advantage the 9 mil has that yeah. we're talking about practicing. You're going to find ammo incomparably easier oh, yeah. if you go with 9 millimeter. 380, and cheaper. Popular, not niche, but. Uh, not really flying off the shelves, which might tell you all you need to about their, their relative pros and cons. If you're looking for something you could fire a lot, you're going to find a lot of 9mm ammo. But Chris, I'm wondering where I can find 9mm ammo for sale. Well, obviously here at Ammo.com is the best place to do it. Like I said at the beginning, if you made it this far in the video, make sure you click that like button and subscribe, and also click the link down in the description. Get yourself that $20 off coupon. Save some money on that practice ammo or your jacketed hollow points, whichever you need. We've got it all here at Ammo.com. Thanks for watching.